Suppose you run a fruit shop, and you ask your assistant, a mathematician, to buy some apples, bananas, and clementines. How many, they ask. Oh, I don't mind, you say. But a blank look follows, so you say, I guess a similar amount of them all, you know, not too many. Another blank look. Ignoring a slightly bad feeling itching at the back of your mind, you say, well, let's say the ratio of apples to everything else, and the ratio of bananas to everything else, and the ratio of clementines to everything else. Let's just say those aren't too big, so let's say they add up to four. And, you know, most apples and fewest clementines, that would be great. The mathematician frightens up, says, great, so I'll go and buy those and I'll, you know, I'll just get a small order this time. Okay, fantastic. Question, how worried should you be? Well, this is a contribution towards the hashtag megafave numbers YouTube project that's been running over the last week or two. So the answer is, well, very. You should be very worried. Universe ending amounts of hard fruit worried. So let's just tidy this up and work out exactly what our mathematician assistant is going to go and do. Well, first thing any decent mathematician is going to do is work out exactly what they're being asked to do. So it's going to be very literal, this friend of ours, and they're going to write down a divided by b plus c plus b divided by c plus a plus c divided by a plus b equals 4. And then they're going to say, I want to find the smallest set of positive integers a, b, and c that obey this, subject to a greater than b greater than c, so we get the most apples and the fewest clementines. Solutions without the integer requirement are easy. So for example, you might have 15 apples, 3 bananas, and 0.9922 something 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 clementines. But a number theorist is not happy with a 1% error. Or you might find that just trying a few small numbers you could get 11 apples, 4 bananas, and minus 1 clementine. And even a fruit monger isn't going to be happy with selling negative numbers of clementines. But finding positive integer solutions turns out not to be quite so easy. In fact, if you run a computer program up to 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, you'll find that actually there don't seem to be any solutions to this. And that's exactly what our mathematician friend is going to discover. So, what's their next step? Well, we might start to think a bit more algebraically about exactly what properties our solutions might have. So one of the first things our mathematician friend might notice is that if a, b, c is a solution, then so is 2a, 2b, 2c. In fact, so is 3a, 3b, 3c, and, and so on. Our whole problem is scale invariant. And that's rather a beautiful property. One feature it means is that we could actually think about just solving this as an equation in the rationals. For example, if we divided everything through by c, then we'd get a solution with a and b rational and c equal to 1. And every solution, at least with a non-zero number of uh, fruit, is equivalent to some such solution. And the same is true the other way around. If I give you a rational solution to a, b, and c, you'd be able to multiply through by some number big enough, and if all of those numbers were rational, you'd get an integer solution. So actually, we can really think about this as an equation over the rationals, and really only an equation in two variables if we wanted to think about it that way. One of the other things a mathematician may well try with this is multiplying through by these denominators. And in fact, you realise that the whole equation can be thought of as a polynomial equation, just products and sums of three unknown variables. Actually, it's a homogeneous degree three polynomial. Homogeneous in degree three because every single term in this polynomial is a product of three unknowns, where, for example, x squared y would count as a product of three unknowns, x, x, and y. Moreover, we accidentally already mentioned another interesting property that our mathematician assistant friend has noticed, which is that there's an integer solution to this equation. There's actually some other simpler ones now we've multiplied through by these denominators, but they're ones which would have given us uh, unpleasant solutions, for example, divisions by zero if we'd substituted them in the original equation. This kind of equation, a homogeneous degree three polynomial in three unknowns with a rational or indeed integer solution, has a special name. It's called an elliptic curve, at least modular one or two small refinements. We can draw this elliptic curve. In fact, really what we mean by the elliptic curve is the set of solutions to this equation. Just by taking our trick from earlier and scaling so that c equals one. And then it's just an equation that relates two unknowns a and b, and we can draw the set of all points say in the AB plane, which satisfy that equation. And it looks something like this. Kind of beautiful, isn't it? And by the way, if you're wondering why it's called an elliptic curve, that's kind of for historical reasons to do with its connection to the length of arcs along ellipses. But we're not really going to get into that today. So 
let's remember what our mathematician friend is trying to do. They're trying to find rational solutions to this. So A and B rational lying somewhere on this curve. And that's easier said than done. OK, so what tricks could our mathematician on the hunt for rational points on this curve use in order to try and find one? Bearing in mind they already know at least one solution. From our earlier values of a, b and c we see that on this graph, with c set to 1, a and b would have values minus 11 and minus 4, which sits over here. Of course, if we're going to end up with a positive solution, with a, b and c all positive, we know that we actually need a rational point that sits in the top right hand corner of this graph, with a and a divided by c and b divided by c both being positive numbers. Those will give us solutions, but we only have a solution sitting outside there. One other thing we should notice is there's a nice symmetry in this graph. Of course, a and b are interchangeable from the point of view of this equation, so there's actually a symmetry in the line a equals b, reflection symmetry. So in fact, for example, we already know that there's another solution to this curve sitting over here, as well as a few other boring ones that you could work out. So. Is there a way that we could use some of the points that we do know lie on these curves to find new ones? Well actually, yes there is. There's a rather beautiful idea in the theory of elliptic curves called the chordon tangent construction. And it goes something like this. Suppose you have two rational points on an elliptic curve like this. Now suppose you draw a line between them. Here's one interesting fact. The slope of that line must be rational, right, because it's defined by these two rational points. OK, here's another interesting fact. Notice that when we drew it, it actually intersected this elliptic curve exactly one more time. Can we see why that is? Well, yes, we can. Such a uh, point would have to obey both the equation of the line and the equation of the cubic, which allows us to substitute the equation for the line into the equation for the cubic, eliminating one of the variables and leaving us inevitably with a cubic equation for the remaining variable, which must have three solutions. The only way this might not happen is if something special happens, for example if there's a double root which would happen exactly when this line lies tangent to this elliptic curve, and we'll come back to that in just one minute. But for now there's an interesting question, where does this third point lie? Well let's think about the equations which it must satisfy. Think about just the horizontal coordinate for now, the one that's left after we've eliminated the other coordinate. It solves a cubic equation with entirely rational coefficients, but we know two of the other solutions. The two other solutions are these two other points which were rational values for that coordinate. But that means we can factorise the cubic into a product of three terms, two of which only involve rational numbers and the third of which involves this unknown point. But when we expand all of this we have to get a rational cubic at the end of the day, and that means that this last term must be rational. So that's really interesting. And moreover, the equation of the line tells us that the other coordinate must also be rational. So this allows us to take two rational points and construct a third rational point sitting on this elliptic curve, which is a really beautiful idea. OK, so that's quite a cool construction. Um, could we go further? Well, slightly annoyingly, if we just had these three points, then it seems like if we try and pick two of them and draw a line between them, we'll only ever find the other point. So it seems like we're not going to be able to generalise this to gain more points, but that's actually wrong on two accounts. So there are two ways we can generalise this. The first way is just by thinking about what happens if we only have a single point. OK, so suppose now we only had one point. I promised you that there was something interesting to say about thinking about tangents to curves, and that is indeed a good idea. So suppose we had one point and we drew a tangent to the elliptic curve at that point and extended that. You can see it actually intersects the curve at one point. OK. So a lot of the argument from before will now go through. We know the location of a double root of a cubic in one coordinate because this line exactly touches this other line. You can think of that as like the limit of that line intersecting at two points and the two points approaching each other. So indeed we have a double root. But there's one other ingredient we need which is that we need that tangent to have rational slope. But actually by a little bit of implicit differentiation, if you know about that, you can check that that's true. If you wanted to check that using implicit differentiation, what you do is you differentiate everything in this equation by a, say, and you get an equation for db by dA, which you could solve, and then substitute in the values for a and b, and well, everything is now rational, so therefore you get a rational slope out for that curve. So indeed, this tangent line has a rational slope, and the argument goes through. You can construct another point which has rational coordinates from just a single point. But it turns out there's another interesting and very natural way of getting a long sequence of points 
which avoids this issue of our construction where it only generated a set of three points without doing more of this tangent type trick. And it goes as follows. Remember that there is a special symmetry of this graph. It has a reflection symmetry in the line A equals B. And so there's actually a really neat operation which goes as follows. Take your first two points, extend the line, get the new point, and then reflect it in the line A equals B. And if you think about this as being an operation which takes two points and gives you a third point, now that is an operation which can be repeated using one of the initial points and that new point to generate another new point. And this is the trick we're going to use. So firstly, let's do the tangent at this point. And intersect that into the curve. And well, okay, we get an equation. We factorize out the solutions which we know, and then we can find the location of the third solution. And it looks like this, which translates into another solution for a, b, and c, which looks rather remarkable, looks like this. And okay, that's good, it's a bit bigger. Still not positive though, so that's a bit disappointing. So we could now draw a tangent at this new coordinate, or we could draw a line from the old coordinate to the new one. Okay, well, when we start following this procedure, what we're gonna find is that actually we get increasingly complicated large numbers, which is coming from these denominators getting more and more complicated. So in order to keep that as small as possible, what we're going to do is we're always going to use the original point as one of the two points and keep drawing lines. So we'll start from this point, we'll draw a line through that and the next point, and we get a third point. And again, this gives us a solution in A, B, and C, which looks like this. Okay, so this is now getting quite large, but still not sitting in this area which gives us positive solutions, so that's a bit unfortunate. So let's do it again. Draw a line from the original point to this latest point. A little bit more complicated, still not any good. And we keep going a few more times. And just eventually we'll find that one of these strays into this upper right quadrant and gives us a positive solution. And it looks like this. Wow, that is a lot of fruit. 1.5 times 10 to the 80 apples. And it's more than enough for your five a day. In fact, actually, that's enough to give five items of fruit to every atom in the observable universe, quite probably. So, yeah, that's enough. By the way, if you'd put 896 on the right-hand side of that equation, and I don't know why you would, but, you know, why not, then you'd have had to play this cordon tangent game a little bit longer in order to end up in the right region of this graph. In fact, you'd have had to go until the 161,477th point, I think? And the number of apples that you'd have had to find in order to fulfill that order would have trillions of digits. The number of apples would have trillions of digits. In fact, in order to write it down, this paper points out that you'd have to have something like 6,250 copies of the 20 volume edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, just in order to write the number down. That is a big number. So probably the thing that's not very satisfying about this is that I haven't convinced you that this is the least number of apples that you can solve this equation with. It turns out it is, but that's a lot harder to prove. I can give you some sense of why it might be true, just by showing you something interesting about the way that we were generating solutions. So you may have wondered what would have happened if we'd started drawing lines between, say, you know, the second and fourth of these points here. Well, actually you'd see that that was one of the points that we found anyway. In fact, if you label these points in the right way, you'll unearth some rather surprising structure. So if you think about this original point as P, and then you think about this process of drawing a line tangent at P, or if you like drawing a line from P to P and extending it, if you think about that as defining the point to P, then it's quite natural to define the point that you get from taking P and 2P as being 3P. And now if you do the same thing again and go from 1P to 3P to get 4P, you'll see that actually had you taken the point 2P and drawn a tangent at that point, it would have given you the same point 4P. 
So if you like, 2p plus 2p is 4p. And this continues. So for example, if we take second and fifth, that gives us the seventh. So it's the third and fourth that also gives us the seventh. So actually taking different sets of these points in different orders doesn't give us any new solutions on this graph. Of course, we know there are some other points, for example, the ones that you get by swapping A and B, but those don't tell us anything new. But these still aren't quite all of the solutions. And actually, if you just tried out some small numbers, you'd see that the 11, 4, minus 1 solution isn't the only solution, even up to scaling and reordering these numbers. There's another solution that involves these also quite small numbers instead. And as I mentioned, actually, there's a very simple solution, which was just this. But these don't actually give you very many different solutions to the ones we started with. They do give you a few different ones, but they don't add very much. So actually, there's a really remarkable structure to the set of all rational solutions that sit on this curve. It's something called a finitely generated abelian group in general for elliptic curves. And for this one, it happens to be this particular finitely generated abelian group. And OK, that's a very complicated set of words, but it means something very simple for this particular elliptic curve. We can just interpret it in the following way. Every single rational point on this curve can be labelled by giving one number, which is an integer, positive or negative, from minus infinity to infinity. That corresponds to this said factor. And also, this other factor here just tells us that there's another label, which is one of the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. There's a label which can be any of six things. And if you take any of these points, there's a very simple rule for generating the next point by combining two of these, you just add those two labels. And the one that can only take value 0 through 5, well, you take that modulo 6. And that actually does describe all of the rational solutions that sit on this curve. The fact that there's only one z factor here is what's kind of making this relatively easy to manage. That means that the rank of this elliptic curve is 1. So if there's a higher power of z, that means that the rank is higher. And that means that there's a noticeably more complicated space of solution. So in our solution above, we only actually found these points. And of course, there are a few more, but it's actually not too hard to check that we don't get anything earlier in this sequence that gets us a positive solution. Of course, there's one other thing you have to check, which is that as you keep going, this never actually suddenly gets simpler. So we don't get smaller solutions for A, B, and C. And there's an even more complicated thing called the notion of heights on elliptic curves that tells you that indeed things basically only get more complicated as you go down the sequence, and therefore earlier is better, and therefore this is indeed the minimal solution to our problem. And that, in short, is why you should never hire a mathematician. Okay, that's it. Thank you for watching. I'm glad you made it to the end. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it and maybe learned a little something along the way. Um, I'm hoping to start making some more videos sometime soon. This has been something I've been meaning to do for a very long time. So if you're interested in things like maths or theoretical physics, so I'm actually a theoretical physicist by trade, um, or maybe computer science or other things like that, then please do subscribe, hit the bell, and then maybe you'll find out if I actually get round to making some more videos, which I certainly hope to get round to in the coming months. So once more, thank you very much for watching and hope to see you soon.